Greetings and hello. On January 28, 1943, Congressman Hatton W. Sumners of Texas spoke candidly before the House of Representatives about a group of volunteer civilian aviators whose services to the nation were little known. His, quote, interest was aroused in this organization because of its demonstrated unselfish, self-reliant willingness to do something about it, fit to live and govern in a free democracy sort of spirit. Responding to Sumner's comments, Congressman John M. Voorhees of Ohio noted how he himself flew active duty anti-submarine patrols with the civilian organization during the summer 1942 recess. Voorhees praised their collective spirit of, quote, self-reliance and resourcefulness, although in performing their flying missions, their discipline and obedience meet military standards. These were the men and women of the Civil Air Patrol. Between the Office of Civilian Defense and the War Department, the movement to militarize the civilian aviation community of CAP into a fourth arm of the nation's defense would unfold over the first half of 1942. Then for 18 months from 1942 through 1943, these CAP civilian volunteers flying armed, light, privately owned aircraft operated an anti-submarine coastal patrol as part of the American military effort in the Battle of the Atlantic. This effort represented a pre-war possibility termed wartime exigency, a product of multiple individuals bound by the idea that light aircraft and private citizens could serve a national defense purpose. In the context of this grand experiment, CAP became the first American civilians to actively engage enemy forces in the defense of the United States, proving the worth of auxiliary air services. CAP's Coastal Patrol Initiative developed from a critical need to stem the tide of German submarine operations inflicting heavy losses on coastal shipping. Begun as a sub-experiment by the Army Air Forces in March of 1942, CAP's effort commenced with meager resources and no practical experience in anti-submarine warfare. Senior Navy leaders cast a wary gaze upon the civilian undertaking and considered the entire endeavor to be problematic. Within weeks of operation, however, CAP's small effort demonstrated the discipline and military bearing desired by the armed forces. The Army embraced the CAP Coastal Patrol and eventually won over the Navy to boost the Coastal Anti-Submarine Deterrent and Aerial Convoy Escort. Following the discontinuance of CAP Coastal Patrol operations in late August 1943, the entire story has faded from national memory. Scholars have oftentimes ignored the CAP contribution in the Battle of the Atlantic as little more than a sideshow warranting a sentence, or at best, a paragraph. Even within CAP, the Coastal Patrol story is at times misunderstood or misinterpreted. Drawing from unpublished, previously unavailable archival material, this talk will frame the CAP Coastal Patrol effort in relation to the Army and the Navy's domestic anti-submarine operations from 1942 to 1943. CAP's overall origins trace back to 1936, when Gil Rob Wilson, a veteran aviator from World War I and the New Jersey Director of Aviation, spent a month in the Third Reich studying German air development. Convinced that a future conflict was inevitable, Wilson returned to the United States and flushed out an idea to use civilian pilots, ineligible for military service, for defensive purposes in their respective state or local communities. Other private citizens shared this idea of employing civilian aviation for national defense. In Toledo, Ohio in 1938, Milton Knight, a glass company executive, incorporated the Civilian Air Reserve, designed to train private pilots for national defense purposes. Self-described as semi-military, the CAR mirrored the Army Air Corps structure with military titles and ranks. And although the CAR only expanded to a handful of states, it demonstrated what volunteer civilian airmen could accomplish for national defense purposes. With the September 1939 commencement of hostilities in Europe, voices concerned about American home defense began to contemplate if, how, or when they too might be subject to nightly visits by enemy bombers. In a February 1941 report to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, New York City Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia recommended creating a home defense organization among the population and training ordinary citizens to meet the threat of air or naval attack on American cities. On May 20, 1941, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8757, establishing the Office of Civilian Defense. Roosevelt then tapped LaGuardia to serve as director and tasked him with coordinating federal civilian defense activities with those of state and local governments. 
By late June, LaGuardia received a proposal for creating a, quote, civil air defense services to use civilian aviators on a voluntary basis for national defense purposes. Any federal funding provided would only be used for fuel, lubrication, and maintenance. The states would absorb all remaining costs. LaGuardia sent the plan to the War Department for review. Major General Henry H. Hap Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Forces, affirmed that, quote, the organization of the existing private flying resources is highly desirable from a national defense standpoint. In mid-August, an informal board of Air Corps officers studied the various plans for organizing civil aviation and concluded that civilian pilots and plane owners, properly organized and trained, could potentially, quote, perform many missions, such as coastal and other patrol, tow target flying, anti-aircraft searchlight and sound detector training, transportation of personnel and supplies of all types, etc. The Office of Civilian Defense thereafter developed an organization along these lines to be known as Civil Air Patrol in fall of 1941. The War Department loaned Major General John F. Curry to serve as CAP's national commander. And on December 8, 1941, LaGuardia formally established CAP and publicly announced it in an evening address as, quote, an organization of the civilian aviation resources of the nation for national defense service. Members and units began joining and materializing nationwide over the next few weeks, looking for a mission with which to test their mettle. On January 12, 1942, five German U-boats commenced sinking merchant shipping off the eastern seaboard of North America. The German offensive, codenamed Pokenschlag, or Drumbeat, delivered a jarring blow to the American home front and found the nation's military under-equipped and ill-prepared to combat the U-boat menace. Rear Admiral Adolphus Angers, commander of the Navy's Eastern Sea Frontier, and Lieutenant General Hugh A. Drum, commanding the Army's Eastern Defense Command, lacked sufficient aircraft and patrol vessels to defend, much less actively attack, enemy submarines. A further lack of coordination hampered defensive efforts, with Navy and Army assets under the control of the respective sea frontier or defensive command. Throughout January and February of 42, General Curry received letters from individuals suggesting the use of light aircraft for shore and coastal patrol operations, including armed patrols. During this same period, heavy tanker losses gravely concerned industry and government officials. By the end of February, the U-boats had either damaged or destroyed 22 tankers. One Civil Air Patrol pilot deeply aware of the terrible shipping losses was William D. Mason. As manager of Sun Oil's Marcus Hook Refinery in Pennsylvania, Mason believed CAP aircraft could fly over the shipping lanes to protect tankers and provide visible support to the uneasy morale of the tanker crews. He shared his views with Sun Oil's president, J. Howard Pugh, who guaranteed $10,000 to General Curry to establish CAP tanker patrols. By early February, Curry presided over a plan for Civil Air Patrol to operate two patrol bases at Atlantic City, New Jersey and Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Curry asked General Arnold to use CAP for 30 days as an auxiliary force for the Army Air Force's anti-submarine patrol effort under the control of the 1st Air Support Command. Despite Army doubts as to the effectiveness of the civilian effort, Curry received Army funding and approval for a 30-day experiment of the CAP bases. Upon approval on February 28, 1942, CAP National Headquarters immediately activated its first and second task forces at Atlantic City and Rehoboth Beach, respectively, with instructions to, quote, establish an inshore anti-submarine patrol for the purpose of reporting the locations of enemy submarines and friendly vessels in distress. Both task forces were instructed to patrol from dawn to dusk no more than 15 miles offshore over the Delaware and New Jersey sectors. Equipped with two-way radios, the CAP air crews would submit contact reports for any observed hostile submarines, vessels in distress, or unusual activities to Army authorities. The, the unsophisticated CAP aircraft, flying slow, low-level patrols over the ocean, proved ideal for spotting small objects easily missed by high-speed military aircraft. CAP's aircraft also provided a cheap and conveniently visible deterrent to U-boat surface operations. Aircraft in general pose the greatest threat to U-boats because of their speed, small size, and the vulnerability of the submarine's pressure hulls to damage from bombs. Now, U-boat doctrine entailed 
taking two actions upon sighting an aircraft during the day. If a watch crew sighted an aircraft far in the distance, the boat would change course, reduce speed, and turn away, showing a narrow outline while minimizing its visible wake. If an aircraft was flying directly toward a U-boat, the boat had to crash dive at once. This entailed submerging as quickly as possible and fleeing the area in case of retaliation, thereby breaking off potential attacks. Following rather public attacks by Japanese and German submarines off Santa Barbara, California and Stewart, Florida in late February, Robert A. Lovett, Assistant Secretary of War for Air, wrote Arnold and suggest using CAP aircraft for offshore patrols, notably painted in Army Air Corps colors and insignia, to scare away submarines from critical port facilities on the east, west, and gulf coasts. Admiral Andrews expressed the same idea, suggesting to Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet and Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest J. King about using a, quote, scarecrow patrol of CAP aircraft in a continuous daylight patrol off the entire coast. Andrews requested King's approval to make arrangements for this effort possible. King, however, rejected use of civilian aircraft for coastal patrol duty since CAP aircraft, quote, would not be productive in a sufficient degree to compensate for the operational difficulties to be encountered in coordinating and controlling the flying involved by inexperienced personnel. But the Army, however, sought expansion since CAP coastal patrol bases could conveniently replace military units for operations needed either domestically or overseas. In late March, Andrews received operational control of elements of the 1st Bomber Command, 1st Air Support Command, and all CAP Coastal Patrol units. The desired Scarecrow Patrol slowly emerged between the spring and summer. In May of 1942, the War Department transferred $160,000 to the Office of Civilian Defense to fund new Coastal Patrol bases in Florida, Georgia, and Virginia. With estimated monthly base costs calculated at only $20,000 for 12 to 15 aircraft, these Army funds provided for personnel per diem and reimbursements for hourly aircraft operational costs. But all other funds would come from the individual CAP members themselves or whatever the basis could beg, borrow, or requisition. CAP faced a steep learning curve for anti-submarine operations and drew from some of its best wings, aircraft, and personnel. Now, the base is typically numbered from 55 to 76 personnel, with 15 pilots and observers, respectively, and at least 15 aircraft flying a daily average of 40 hours. The pilots had to have a minimum of 200 flying hours, and both pilots and observers required a practical working knowledge of air navigation. Aircraft on Coastal Patrol represented a mix of nearly two dozen different manufacturers and 10 engine types of at least 90 horsepower. Well over half of the aircraft on CAP Coastal Patrol service consisted of either the Stinson Voyager 10A or the Fairchild 24. These first CAP Coastal Patrols were almost entirely improvised affairs, trial and error. Procedures and profiles for Coastal Patrol missions emerged in time. The patrols consisted of two ship formations with two man crews of pilot and observer flying from dawn to dusk at altitudes ranging from a few hundred to perhaps a thousand feet above the waves for hours at a time up to 15 miles offshore. Instruction for air crews came internally, either from among task force personnel or from, from civilian aviation experts. Eventually the bases received some anti-submarine warfare training materials from the Army and Navy. But with the commencement of Coastal Patrol convoys in May 1942, CAP Coastal Patrol bases began receiving tasking orders for convoy escort from the respective sea frontiers. With easy targets no, now no longer available on the east coast, U-boats shifted their operations southward along the Florida coasts into the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, where aerial defenses were in short supply. That month, U-boat attacks rose sharply and losses in the Gulf sea frontier doubled those of the eastern sea frontier. This southward movement of the U-boat offensive contributed to the arming of CAP Coastal Patrol aircraft. Around dusk on May 6th, a CAP aircraft reported sighting a U-boat just off Cape Canaveral, having run aground in shallow water. The men radioed for help, but none arrived until after the boat had vanished. Upon hearing this, Arnold ordered 1st Air Force to arm CAP aircraft with 100-pound bombs, and all of the patrols received new guidance to, quote, take all action within their means to destroy any enemy sighted.
Now the Army's decision to arm and empower CAP air crews demonstrated a growing trust in the civilian organization and a sense of urgency in staunching merchant shipping losses. CAP now faced the challenges of conducting and sustaining patrol operations with the added responsibility of carrying armament and maintaining both the personnel and aircraft bearing the explosive burden. By July, the War Department authorized all CAP members to wear regular Army uniforms with certain distinguishing features, particularly a new shoulder sleeve insignia sporting U.S. to ensure treatment as belligerents under international law, and somewhat garish red shoulder loops. Army funding facilitated CAP activation of additional Coastal Patrol bases to provide coverage in the entire Gulf Sea frontier. And by late September 1942, CAP would claim 21 Coastal Patrol bases, providing inshore daytime aerial coastal patrol coverage from Maine to Mexico. By then, CAP's Coastal Patrol growth overwhelmed the, previously, the previous supervisory abilities of First Ground Air Support Command. But thankfully, the activation in October 1942 of the Army Air Force's Anti-Submarine Command provided CAP with greater guidance to standardize and professionalize operations on par with Army and Navy procedures. All Coastal Patrol bases would now maintain two aircraft with combat crews on alert during daylight hours on call for on-command missions. Patrols now would be limited to no more than flying 60 miles offshore. Convoy escort missions also receive specific maneuver instructions for improved coverage. Now these new mission requirements, however, strain CAP's available resources to maintain the bases and the operational readiness for its diverse fleet of aircraft. Aircraft maintenance at the earlier bases varied in quality, but the newer bases faced poor or non-existent facilities, trouble in acquiring parts, and insufficient equipment and personnel for aircraft repair and upkeep. Aircrew and airframe fatigue became problematic. Now sympathetic military personnel helped individual bases where possible, helping repair dangerously worn out aircraft, providing vital life-saving equipment, and in several instances, overhauling and repainting worn out civilian aircraft in Navy three-tone camouflage. The breaking point came, however, in November of 1942. CAP National Headquarters reported high morale, but serious difficulties securing aircraft parts and other materials necessary for operations. After suffering only one fatality in July of 1942, nine CAP Coastal Patrol aircrew died in accidents and crashes from October to December. Unable to obtain a certificate of military necessity to obtain parts and, and other required maintenance, CAP informed the Army of its intention to immediately dissolve its Coastal Patrol operation. Thankfully, decreased enemy submarine activity gave the military sufficient rationale to reduce CAP Coastal Patrol operations and later decide its ultimate future. To curtail profitless flying during a period of negligible enemy activity, the Army and Navy ordered CAP to reduce Coastal Patrol flying and instead focus its efforts on training for personnel and the maintenance of aircraft and base facilities. In mid-December, King directed his Gulf and Eastern Sea Frontier commanders to curtail CAP operations by at least 30% over the next three months, with additional one-third reductions planned for March and June of 1943 to thus conclude the entire civilian effort by August of that year. Meanwhile, the Army and the Office of Civilian Defense entered into discussions in early 1943 to transfer CAP to the War Department. A transfer would enable the provision of equipment and supplies for CAP's current and future operations, and made greater sense considering that the Army Air Forces already paid for 95% of CAP's operations. Consequently, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9339 on April 29, 1943, transferring Civil Air Patrol to the War Department. On that day, CAP reported having 1,683 personnel and 423 aircraft assigned to Coastal Patrol duty. The availability of aircraft parts and maintenance notably improved with this transfer, but unfortunately the majority of previously unavailable Army material would not reach the Coastal Patrol effort. The day after CAP's transfer to the War Department, Admiral King directed the Eastern and Gulf Sea Frontier commanders to relieve and replace all CAP Coastal Patrol units with military personnel and aircraft by August 31st. The Army Air Forces replied in mid-May that they had no objection to closing the CAP Coastal Patrol, and the civilian effort quietly ceased at sundown, August 31st. Statistically, from March of 1942 to August of 1943, 
CAP flew 86,685 individual Coastal Patrol missions, totaling 244,600 flying hours. CAP air crews reported sighting 91 vessels in distress, 173 suspected submarines, 363 survivors of attacks, 36 dead bodies, and 17 floating mines. At the request of the Navy, CAP also conducted 5,684 special convoy escort missions. Originally a skeptic, King commended the work of the CAP Coastal Patrol on August 11, 1943, expressing a well done for their enthusiastic, loyal, and constant cooperation and performance of its mission. Arnold, one of CAP's biggest proponents, reflected on the value and the impressive accomplishments of the Coastal Patrol to both CAP and the nation in a speech of December 16, 1944. Quote, the Civil Air Patrol patrolled our shores and performed its anti-submarine work at a time of almost desperate national crisis. If it had done nothing beyond this, the Civil Air Patrol would have earned an honorable place in the history of American air power. As a component of the overall American anti-submarine defense plan, CAP's Coastal Patrol proved senior military leaders wrong. Private citizens demonstrated sufficient competency and professionalism for the military to equip and entrust them with weapons and release authority to use deadly force against lawful combatants. With a minimum of funding from government, industry, and private citizens, CAP's Coastal Patrol members managed to organize, equip, and operate 21 independent air bases, providing a stopgap measure when the nation's armed forces lack the, access, the assets to deter and constrain enemy submarine operations. The motley assortment of low technology, cloth skin CAP aircraft integrated with increasingly sophisticated military assets. Together, these aircraft escorted thousands of American and allied merchant ships along the nation's coastlines, enabling safe passage to ports in the European and Pacific theaters of war. Amidst CAP successes, however, can also be found considerable shortcomings. As with many military operations, logistical issues proved problematic. A diverse fleet of airframes and engines, together with limited parts, maintenance facilities, and personnel, resulted in dangerous aircraft flown by tired crews. Considering the long daily overwater patrols with inadequate survival equipment and ordnance strained airframes, it is either a miracle or a testament to American aeronautical engineering that CAP lost only 90 aircraft with 26 personnel killed and seven seriously injured during 18 months of operation. Arguably, greater initial investment in CAP's Coastal Patrol effort from the Army may have altered U-boat operations off the East and Gulf Coasts. Recognizing the monthly cost to operate a CAP Coastal Patrol base versus the purchase of a single B-24 heavy bomber, which cost approximately $297,000, a modicum of additional War Department funding could have placed more CAP aircraft on Coastal Patrol in areas of high U-boat traffic during the critical period of April to June 1942. This argument in particular applies to the Gulf Coast states where hastily erected CAP bases and coastal patrols would have provided air coverage of tankers sailing off the Louisiana coast. Regardless of being armed or not, the deterrent scarecrow element of CAP played a factor in pushing the U-boat threat away from the nation's coastline. The successful civil military relationship embodied in the coastal patrol effort is a critical factor in CAP's post-war survival. Incorporated in 1946 and established as the Civilian Auxiliary of the United States Air Force in 1948, today's CAP volunteers work alongside uniformed Air Force personnel in a number of missions, from search and rescue to unmanned aircraft escorts to air intercept training. In an era of budget uncertainty and limited resources, the Air Force is the only major service that has a doctrinally integrated civilian auxiliary. Much as World War II's Coastal Patrol delivered a valuable asset for minimal outlay, today's CAP members provide a four-to-one return on investment, enabling the Air Force to increase training and liberate assets for deployment and greater operational use elsewhere. Operating one of the largest fleets of single-engine aircraft in the world in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia, the Air Force has an operational and civil military relations resource unlike any of the other uniformed services. On the basis of cost-benefit analysis alone, it may behoove the other uniformed services to examine the potential of establishing civilian auxiliaries from which to draw added strength for the safety of the homeland. Thank you all for your attention. 
This talk is but a glimpse of a larger book-length study which will be released by Air University Press this fall. I hope the talk has motivated you to consider downloading the manuscript or requesting a print copy for your reading pleasure and further study. Thank you.